Ever so often, someone writes a book that really needed to be written. Home Truths, which analyzes Britain's housing shortage, is one such book. And I'm delighted to be joined by its author, the economist and journalist, Liam Halligan. Welcome, Neil. Nice to see you, William. Thanks for inviting me on. Pleasure, great. Now, on the front of the book, um, the, there's a sort of a strap line, how this happened, why it matters, and how to solve it. So I want to cover all that, but to give us a sort of paint a picture, could you identify, outline the scale of the problem? Well, we've built far too few homes in the UK. Uh, I'd say we'd, we've built two to three million too few homes over the last 30 odd years. And it's not just me that says that, eminent analysts like um, uh, Professor Paul Cheshire at the London School of Economics, the economic geographer, uh, agree. And that fundamental shortage of homes in the UK to both rent and to buy and social housing too, Home Truths covers all three of those sectors, has fundamentally pushed prices of both renting and buying homes up. It's pushed up the price of land to build homes. Uh, the housing industry in this country is wildly over-concentrated. It's an oligopoly. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that increasing numbers of ordinary men and women, hardworking families, pay far too much mm -hmm. for the roof over their head, whether they're renting mm -hmm. or buying. It means we've got chronic overcrowding in this country. It means that um, social mobility is massively impacted. Uh, geographic mobility is massively impacted. Mm -hmm. This dominates our model of capitalism. Mm -hmm. This is, in my view, the most serious market failure mm -hmm. across the world's fifth biggest economy. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of Cinderella subject within politics. Uh, Shouldn't be. Yeah, if you talk to ordinary people, if you focus group ordinary people, it's always at or near the top of their concerns. Can my kid buy a house? Will my kid be able to secure social housing the way I was able to secure social housing? Can my kid move to where the work is so they can build a decent life future for themselves, whether they're going to rent or whether they're going to buy? The party that solves the housing issue across the UK will be in power for a very, very long time, William, and will deserve to be. Yeah, I think you, there's so much there. I think the, you, you outline the basic problem, which is that we haven't built enough houses of the right type and the right place. So if you, if you try to analyse why this has happened, what are the reasons? Because it's gone on a long time. I mean, I, I'm very worried that you can't solve a problem like this quickly. This is not a party political um, statement. Uh, parties from across the political spectrum have woefully failed to... Uh, enable the building of enough houses. I'm not saying the state should build loads of houses. Though I do think we do need more mm. state house building, not built by state workers, but mm. by the private sector, enabled by the state, by local authorities, by, so by housing associations. But also the, the state needs to regulate the environment in which private sector house building takes place. So there is some competition. There isn't nearly enough competition. Mm. You know, back in the 1930s and then during the 50s and 60s, we had an army of small and medium sized house builders in this country. Mm -hmm. They were very competitive among themselves, um, that they produced housing that was of decent quality. Uh, so when people made the most important purchase of their lives, they were uh, the consumer uh, wasn't discriminated against those small and medium sized house builders were competing on both quality and price. Mm. Competition within the house building industry has gone almost completely out the window. Uh, we have uh, so many small and medium sized firms were blown out of the water by the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. Uh, their, their land stakes were bought up by much bigger companies. And now you have uh, the top 10 house builders in the UK accounting for about 70% of all output. They're regional uh, and localized monopolies or oligopolies. Mm. Uh, and that's why, you know, when I bought my first property, William, back in the mid 90s, the average house across the UK was about four times the average wage yeah. in the UK, which eight was times, nine times around now. the long term mm. average. It's now eight, nine times, that's an average. Mm. Uh, in parts of London and the southeast, it's 
it's 15 to 20 times, but it's not just the London set and the southeast phenomenon. You have, you have people being priced out of the housing market um, in the northwest, in parts of the northeast, certainly lots of our coastal communities where you have so many people buying holiday homes. I repeat, this is not a London and southeast only phenomenon. This you, is across the country. Yeah, so taking, taking on board what you've said about the private sector and the supply side there, that's one issue. So let's park that for the moment. I agree with what you're saying. I think you know the, the, there is a cartel, there's an oligopoly. It's, it's you, you're dealing with deeply vested interests that have bought the government, basically. And there's, a, there's a bit of, you, you mentioned how much you know how much I think it was, 50, was it 11 million given to the Tory Party to buy them off, basically, in a single. Yeah, year. the FT yeah. copied out a section of Home Truths and just yeah. put it on the front page last week. So there you go. So, but thanks, it, but thanks that, for the acknowledgement, guys. It's that, yeah, it's outrageous. But so it, you have a cartel and it's blocked in. But let's just go back a bit because you also argue rightly, I think for what you call a mixed economy in housing oh, and yeah. supply side. And that's, I, so this, let's focus on that because I think it's chart 2.11 in the book and you, you see it sort of, you know, the, the, I mean, there was an economic turn in 76 with Callaghan and really did, did, did the, was the turn then probably, but 1979, Mrs. Thatcher gets in, 42% of people live in council houses and the, the supply side on the, on the public sector side just is choked off to virtually nothing. And you, you make the point, uh, you know, over 300 principal local authorities now very few do any council house building it's just been taken off and i think you can't you couldn't take off an entire sector off the table and for it not to have a catastrophic effect yeah i mean i look i i i wanted to write home truths um because i grew up in a first generation home ownership household so my mum grew up in a council house my dad grew up in a you know stone hut in ireland <laughs> um they were the first in both their respective families probably ever to own their own home. Uh, and they were ordinary working people. They're not particularly educated people at all. Um, but by working hard and doing the right thing, they were able to- There's a route. Yeah, there yeah. was a route out yeah. of poverty, yeah. Yeah. out of insecurity. Yeah. It was a route towards autonomy, choices, uh, and, you know, a tiny bit of wealth um, a bit of capital in a capitalist society uh, and that revolutionized their lives mm -hmm. and I grew up in that environment in a metro land as it's used to be called sort of unfashionable metropolitan London, London suburb yeah. the kind of London mm -hmm. suburb that so many of our well-heeled policymakers and analysts sniff at but mm -hmm. the place where I grew up I'm extremely proud I grew up there it was full of first generation home ownership families and or families living in low rise, low density, good quality social housing. There was green space. Um, and a lot of competition. A lot of the, a lot and, of the, and, the 30 and, and what, suburbs. Yeah. yeah. And what yeah. I did is I basically did a sort of biography in one chapter of my own house where I grew up and it, I found out when it was built. I found out how much it was bought for. Shared garden at the front. Yeah, I yeah. did, I did yeah. some maths realized it was like four times average earnings in london at that time and now it's like you know 15 20 times average earnings in it and it's not as nice it's a insane. place to live as I, as it was when i lived there and it's massive beds in sheds problem massive density um so you, and, and, and so the, the book was meant to be about home ownership and the importance of home ownership and why home ownership was falling, why the UK was now below the EU average in terms of home ownership, this nation of homeowners so-called. But the more I read and the deeper I got into the book, I realised I'd have to write lots about social housing too. Um, and I became very familiar with a lot of the work of, of, of people at Shelter and elsewhere who, mm -hmm. who gave the book a fabulous in, endorsement. There's not many people who on the front of their book have got an endorsement from Andrew Neal and, and, the, and, and the chief exec of Shelter. And <laughs> Sandra um, Javid. Um, because I think you're right, William, unless you have a fair chunk of social housing being built each year, not only do you have a situation where lots of lower income and vulnerable households don't have a place to live and we've got you know a million long housing list now in terms of social housing we have chronic overcrowding in the uk we have huge numbers of what are called concealed households Beds households and sheds. Yeah. living within yeah. other households yeah. semi-officially not just you know a, a, a young woman with a kid living with her mum i'm talking about couples 
living with other couples, with or without children. There are millions of those happening now across the UK. And as you say, the beds in shared issue, which again is not just a London phenomenon, it's happening in Oxford, it's happening in Salford, it's happening in Bristol, it's happening you know, in Newcastle. Um, but essentially the, the, the reason, the sort of why, the, the why it's happened is actually quite clear. So you've taken off an entire sector, you've... you've, you've yeah, you, ne you need the social housing to keep the private sector honest, if you like. You need them to take up part of the slack, because if you don't build decent amounts of social housing, we end up in a situation like we currently are, where vulnerable households are put in privately rented accommodation and we end up spending 25, 30 billion pounds a year on housing benefit, which is where we currently are. That's insane. Let's shift that subsidy, that public subsidy of lower income household uh, housing away from benefits and into bricks. Yeah, that's, that seems to be the, I mean, I think the whole thing is irresponsible. I think it's grossly irresponsible to, to break the, the reasonable ex expectation that a, a, a person could find the, the love of their life, possibly settle down, have a family. That's been broken. It's a, it's a serious breach of the social contract. I don't, I, I, you know, in, in some ways I think, has it been totally deliberate? I, th I think it probably has. On the state sector side, I think you just have to look at it and you, you, you say it's been taken out of the picture deliberately. I think the vested interest points about how the private sector works, as you say, that's partly a post GFC falling out of very small billing companies. Obviously, global financial crisis. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah and that's that's that was a, a problem. But I'm I'm not very charitable about about what what they've done to social housing and in particular old fashioned council housing. I, I chair a small community council in Northumberland. We're building four council houses. They weren't. They're not going to be subject to right to buy. There and and my you know that scale of local government small but there are 14,000 such councils there are there are, as you say in the book hundreds of principal local authorities none of them yeah. do any proper very few of them do any proper mm. house building and I think there's it's partly a cultural thing as I wanted to speak to you about this it's not just it's it's a sort of a, a demoralization that the state could and should do this stuff to train people in the skills necessary as they used to offer uh, you know, uh, apprenticeships and so on to train them and have the capacity. And I'm not. We we wouldn't ask for very much. I don't think we're asking for a mixed economy in housing. We're not asking for very much. We're asking for something that used to be the case that's been removed and that should be put back. But it wouldn't on the maths. It wouldn't actually. Even the London boroughs. If you if the London boroughs built as many units as a small company did, times by 32. Increase, you know, times by 3.2 average household size, you housing thousands of people. You could. Now, I, I would be wary of a model where the state employs lots and lots of people directly. I just don't think it's efficient. Uh, they tried that and it didn't work. It didn't work in the UK. It didn't work, you know, across the post-communist world. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have a vibrant social housing sector where you know you, the purchaser provider split, right? Which was the heart of the original SDB mm. model yeah. back in the day. Social we, market. We've talked about that yeah. in the past. But there are many reasons it isn't happening. Uh, it's worth saying that yes, council house building fell under Thatcher. Uh, the right to buy you know, was meant to uh, bring in a situation where local authorities would sell houses to their um, uh, re uh, inhabitants, Tenants, but, yeah. but then yeah. you would have to replace them one for one, and, and that part of the never bill happened. never really happened. I mean, that's what Michael Hesstein and Peter Walker wanted when they brought the bill in. But it was under Blair and Brown that council housing really went to almost zero. I mean, there were, in many local authorities, it was zero during those new Labour years. And then, of course... It's absolutely shocking. It, it is yeah, absolutely yeah. shocking for a centre-left government. And then under Osborne and Cameron, so you know, you quite, quite cynically, I think, Osborne and Cameron didn't feel that people in council houses were their people. But And we've got a problem at the moment because councils are not incentivized at all to build social housing or have the them built yeah because yeah. because they have to sell them to their their tenants after just a few years mm. and they have to sell them at a knockdown price mm. that's below the market price probably for less than they spent building them and then even worse mm. Four fifths of the proceeds of a council selling a council house then go to the treasury. I can only. So I, why would I, anyone I, build council houses? I can the only, incentives are all wrong. Under the under the under the big rules, the, the how it's structured now and how it's been structured in the sort of post Thatcher era, I can only I can only conclude 
that it was a deliberate policy to try and destroy the sector and take it off the table. I think that's what happened. I think it's utterly disastrous and irresponsible, but that's what's actually happened. And I think you've got to... I, I'm a bit more optimistic in direct, basic, old, you know, town clerk type provision than you are. Because I think it can, with the right... People say, you know, just culturally it can't work. Well, why? You know, I, I think it could work with the right leadership and you could, you could, you could re-establish a sector which is very, very urgently needed. So, well, however we get but I don't. That. I don't think we should, you know, I don't think we need to get hung up on who, on who builds them, right? I mean, we just need to set an environment in which there is an incentive for them to be built. Mm. And the environment at the moment, it, it undermines any initiative at the council level to build social housing because you have to end up selling them. So, I, I mean, this may sound weird for somebody who writes for The Telegraph, but under the current situations, I would suspend the right to buy because the right oh, yeah. to buy is preventing councils from building houses because they then have to sell them at below market oh, rates oh. and then give the money, four fifths of the money back to the treasury. In Wales, the right to buy has been suspended for that reason. If Peter Walker and Michael Heseltine, both of whom I think were probably had good intentions in, the, in this, if, they, if their aims for it were carried out, fine. But nine to one is the rough ratio that, that were replaced, even even in the, at the peak, and you know that that is that is just dismantling the sector, and yeah. it's 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 uh, verging on criminal. But it, and it's also another example. You see so much of this in British politics all over the place, of of just a, a bad example of high time preference. You know, we'll take the money now mm. and not do the hard thing because we're not going to get any votes for it. It doesn't really matter. Kick it down the road, and eventually you get to a stage where. We are in crisis now, and, you, and that, I, I think it's so sad when you speak to people in their late twenties now, particularly in the southeast. And I know the problem is everywhere, but you, you, people say, "What are you going to do about it?" Well, I have to be honest sometimes. I say, "Well, you know, you, you, you can't solve this directly straight away." I mean, this, that you need about t if it took twenty or thirty years, forty years to get into it, it's going to take certainly decades but to get there, out of but it. But there are there are things you can do. I mean, look, another reason why council housing is so difficult to build is because of the market for land. Uh, councils, you know, we're not using state land that is available um, be be because, yeah, there's lots of it because of treasury dogma. They always say you could get more money for it if you used it some, in some other way. So it just lays completely mm -hmm. idle. You know, NHS trusts have huge amounts of land. The MOD has huge amounts of land that could be used for social housing or made available to small businesses, medium-sized businesses, to put up private sector housing to buy in order to try and infuse competition across the sector. It goes back to, I mean, at the heart of the book is, a, is an account of the 1961 Land Compensation Act. When that, it was when that Land Compensation Act came in, in 1961, that's when house uh, prices uh, a bit rocketed because land prices rocketed. That's when councils started building tower blocks rather than the kind of low density, low rise council housing that I spent so much of my time in that was built in the late 40s and into the 50s. Although some of the tower blocks, if you, if you account for the public open space, the urban nondescript beneath it, mm -hmm. actually it nets down as not much uh, higher density actually. It depends where you are. It depends, it de city, it, depe it, it depends where you are, but the tower blocks coincided with a rocketing in the price of land which made it more difficult for local authorities to buy land. And in my view, it's if you reverse the 1961 Land Compensation Act, which briefly mm. basically means that you start to share the planning uplift between uh, the state and private sector landowners. This is not sort of mad socialism. This is recognizing as Henry George did, the American economist, as Keith Joseph did, you know, obviously the Thatcherite economist, um, that the value of land when you ascribe planning permission to it when it rockets 50, 100, 200, 300 fold, that reflects the infrastructure surrounding the land that's been provided by the state and the community over many years and generations. So that massive gain, some of it should go to the private sector land, I don't know, of course it should, but it should also go to the local authorities. The local authority can then provide infrastructure that the new housing needs, new schools, new hospitals, bypasses, yeah. council tax reductions to offset the disruption of the development. If you did that, and 
planning uplift is shared in many, many other countries. The UK and countries like the UK, like New Zealand and so on, uh, are the outlier. It's, it's a feudal system. You will revolutionise the local politics of planning if when that planning uh, uh, commission is given, the land value rockets and that gain, which then cascades throughout the developer's deal of the long supply chain of people is shared and so local residents know they're going to get this new infrastructure mm -hmm. and then many of them will say oh we'll get a new school mm -hmm. we'll get new doctor surgeries mm -hmm. we might get a council tax reduction i'll go for that yeah you yeah it sounds it's a part of the book which is a little bit technical isn't it when yeah, you talk about uh, increase in value attributable to land to, to change in planning permission but as you say the long and the short of it is that the us what report in the in the, in the war period envisaged a situation where the state would grant planning permission and would get some of the benefit of that. Yeah. Yeah? And that was broken in 61. That was uh, broken the in 61. And, effect, and the effect of that to some And Keith of, Joseph, who was yeah. housing minister at the time, didn't want, didn't want that no, to happen. No, he argued not. against it. Yeah, yeah. He argued for what I'm arguing yeah. and for. You, and you, and what, what, that, what that change in 61 did was it, because you had the 47 uh, so Tanaka, which planning. controlled, the state has control of what we grant planning permission yeah. to. And, and that was aligned uh, early on. And then they basically private, I would describe it crudely, because it is a bit technical, but they, they privatized the betterment, the planning gain, the That's uplift. Right. They privatized it. And, right. and it would be a reasonable, again, we're not asking for very much. No. You said share we, it 50-50. Share it 50-50. It would still be a massive amount. Yeah, share it 50-50. Yeah. What, the, what the Town and Country Planning Act did is it took all the upside and gave it to the state, right? It took all the planning uplift and gave it to the state. Because we were in a sort of post-war post -war Atlee, yeah. New Jerusalem, right? Now, and that was never going to work because it just meant that people just didn't sell their land because they were waiting for Atlee to be unelected and then the Tories to establish the natural feudal order. So, so very little land came forward. So you had massive compulsory purchase and, you know, I mean, listen to the kinks. They write about this in some of their songs. Um, and it was a period when, you know, a lot of wealthy people were absolutely monstered by death duties and all the rest of it. It was not the right time to do it. That's why if you split it 50-50 and a conservative government splits it 50-50, landowners realise, ah, this isn't going to change. Yeah. This isn't going to change. This isn't going to change. So we will put our land forward for development and we will take 50%. And it's not just me saying this, yeah. right? It was Keith Joseph saying it. And I'll tell you another guy who thinks this. The bloke that wrote the foreword to the paperback edition of Home Truth, Sajid Javid, yeah. former chancellor, yeah. he tried to bring exactly this model forward mm -hmm. in a green paper yeah. that I, you know, saw it in draft. So you're up uh, and, and this was in late 2016 when he was business, when he was community secretary. Downing Street blocked it. Theresa May blocked it, mm -hmm. and so we still have this situation. And to put it crudely though, because because actually the, 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 the interests of, of land, major landowners yeah. uh, in, in a distorted policy, or affected policy in the 60s, 50s and 60s, uh, and we're still in that yeah, block. But we're still in that situation. It's still feudal. Yeah. The 61 Land Conversation Act was the last gasp of feudal Britain. It just reimposed basically a, feud, a feudal system yeah. and we've had that ever since. And why are houses so expensive in Britain? Because the land is so expensive. Land is 70% of the value of every new built home now. Back in the 50s, it was 5%. And so basically our house building industry, this oligopoly, is a land speculation industry that does a bit of housing on the side yeah. in order to justify its massive land And it doesn't make its profits from putting bricks on bricks. No, it, it makes it, its profits. It, from, well, from it, does, it does sell overpriced, often low quality, sometimes uh, dangerously low quality, lack mm. of fire safety mm. and all the rest of it, uh, homes, but, uh, but it makes most of its money from land speculation. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you that actually 50% of the betterment planning gain is perfectly sufficient. Perfectly I mean, sufficient. It, as an incentive. Everyone makes money. Every, no, Everyone it's makes of, money. It's a lot of money. And, it, and it, you know, the site finders and, and the, the site finding elements of, of the house building industry have no problem at all in in, in finding and, and the, the, the supply of land itself would not be affected by that. No. In any case, most of the planning authorities are under statutory obligation to, to create uh, their 15, 20 year land supplies anyway. The problem is that the, as you say, that a lot of, it's in the commercial interest. I can understand why mass, uh, large house builders would, would land bank and just drip 
uh, houses on because every single of course this is not a conspiracy right no. house of lords in july 2016 the economic affairs select committee with very very serious people on it people like richard Layal, the professor of economics at lse who i'm honored to say uh, i used to work alongside people like michael forsyth who knows his economics people like the former chancellor nigel lawson that report said quote the uk house building sector sector now has yeah. all the characteristics of an oligopoly yeah. so how are you going to change that well you need to do a full root and branch competition and markets authority inquiry into the house you could give sector. some tax incentives and, and that to should have builders. happened and yeah. it hasn't happened for crudely political reasons because of uh political preferment uh, campaign donations Donation. the property sector is hand in glove now with the top end of the Conservative Party. You can solve the UK's housing crisis, said Roger Scruton in the last interview before he died. But that would mean tackling vested interests, and I'm still in quote marks, vested interests which are very closely entwined with the Conservative Party. Yeah, it's the only, it's the only uh, description of what's happening that makes any sense. And yeah. it's, it's actually very depressing because I don't see. It is very I mean, I, 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 someone said, well, how, what, if you take a sort of absolutely root uh, look at it, how can you how can you try to solve the housing crisis? Well, the first thing you need is a is a is a, a set of people that govern you that actually want to do that. And I don't think we I don't think we have that. I don't think we're anywhere near. The, the political calculus calculus is starting to shift. You know, the Conservatives know that homeowners tend to vote Tory, and that's basically been part of the reason why um, it's been okay if house ownership in this country, home ownership, doesn't get above 60%. Because, and, then, and then once people get on the housing ladder, they tend to switch from sort of youthful you know, dalliances with Labour and the left, and then they start voting Tory in their late 20s or their early 30s. But as the age of people buying their first home, their first property goes up and up and up and up, the Tory's going to lose their natural but you, constituency. But you, when we earlier in the interview, we were looking at consequences of the housing crisis. You know, we're talking about homelessness and inadequate supply yeah. and, and blockage of the dream of having a, you know, having a house and building your family. That's blocked. But one of the other serious consequences is that there's a political consequence to it because the, the, I think a lot of the younger people that were inclined to vote for Corbyn, I don't, I mean, I, in, in terms of housing, I largely agree with his policies of trying to reinvigorate the state sector. I agree with him on that. But, you, but it, 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 it spills over and distorts other things. The IA had a, a, a paper, didn't they, uh, uh, last month about young people's attitudes with capitalism. And as you say in the book, the capitalist system isn't delivering for a lot of people. Of course and it is. And don't be surprised if that's the case. People get more radical. Yeah, of course they do. Well, the reason, the reason we started building uh, social housing in the first place on any scale after the First World War, the reason we started to allow you know, large scale development of private housing for people to buy, mm. the reason we started to pull down the slums mm. uh, and move on from Victorian slash Edwardian Britain into uh, to become a country where housing was reasonable. There were still lots of slums, obviously, into our respective lifetimes, William. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason it happened was, the reason Lloyd George did it and his health secretary, who then became his housing secretary, Christopher Addison, was because they were absolutely terrified by the Russian Revolution yes. of 1917. Quite right. Homes for the heroes followed the Russian Revolution. And I, I can't, you know, the cabinet minutes are in, I quoted them in Home Truths. And the political imperative now should be not quite as alarming, but it should be similar. We, we've been dominated by Brexit. You know, I wrote Home Truths in November 2019. I thought, Brexit would be over. Of course, it wasn't over. We had a snap general election, all the madness. Then we had COVID. But I still feel that housing is, is moving up to the top again of the political agenda. And I agree with you. Before Brexit, uh, uh, before COVID, and when people thought that the Labour Party would actually back Brexit, implementation of Brexit, because it's what it said in their manifesto. Of course, they then lied. Um, um, young people, I think a lot of young people voted for Corbyn to shake things up because even if they had decent jobs, they'd been to university, they'd done the right thing or they had a decent trade, a craft, a skill, they couldn't get on the housing ladder. And their parents who didn't have 
what they had in terms of qualifications, they did get on the housing ladder. So let's shake things up and vote for Corbyn. And I think that makes same, sense. Yeah, that sense. same radical edge to British politics will push into mainstream voting intentions again, unless we solve once COVID is over, once unless we solve this housing problem. And that's why the Tories have to stop messing about pretending they're solving the problem by slightly easing the planning and talking about building beautiful. Not that that isn't important. I got a lot of respect for, I got a lot of respect for Nick Boy Smith. I'm not having go at him at all. He was a big supporter of a lot of what's in Home Truths, by the way. We need to do that. Yes, we need to make the planning system work better, but the problem isn't the planning system when you've got a million planning commissions outstanding that aren't being used, that are being sat on that the big house builders are, are using to bolster the value of their land, to bolster their balance sheets. That's their balance sheet. That, that, that's that's it. it. It's like, it's and, like... and when they get the planning permissions and sit on them, the smaller, medium sized builders can't build houses, right? And this is the problem. It's a blockage. The, the problem is not we're not giving enough planning permissions. We are. Well, the problem the is that planning permissions are not being converted into homes um, people can live in. A lot of people don't understand the planning system. It's the duty of every single major planning authority, principal planning authority, to, to have a, a supply. Plan, that's what planners do. They actually, the supply has to be demonstrated. And if it's not there, you'll end up at a public and cry. You'll get housing anywhere. That's the, that, I totally agree with you. It's, it is the, the land banking problem is an issue. I just want to finish on, a, on a, an important thing, which is the left. You'd expect people to, on the left to argue for for you know, a reinvigorating council, build, council house building and the rest of it, and they do, but they have a blind spot and it's something they won't talk about. It's, it's almost off the agenda. You can't try and link the two, which is immigration. You can't, you're not allowed to talk about very, very high levels of immigration and the impact that that has on, on house prices, on rental prices and the rest of it. Just you know, get David Goodhart and a lot of other people have pointed out at, at its peak under New Labour, uh, gross migration was up well over, uh, you know, three quarters of a million. Now, the, it that net down, might net down to about 350,000. But as you pointed out in the book, we aren't building that much. So your, the actual, you know, net immigration exceeded, and, and it obviously causes net household formation, mm -hmm. and exceeded the numbers. So I, I, that's on the left side. So we, as a party, we would, we would get the correct policy response for lots of other reasons. We think, you know, lower, lower immigration would be better for, for wages. And, you know, we're quite um, defensive on that, quite, quite into trade barriers. And we, we want to, the bigger picture for us is that you want a, an intelligent, selective deglobalization. But that's a slightly separate argument. But you, they will not talk about this. They will not talk, talk about the impact of immigration on it. And the Tories, again, get sort of half the policy right. They talk about reducing immigration, but they have no commitment to building any houses. And the sweet spot is obvious. It's a, a typical red-blue mix of policy, which is let's reduce mass migration to reason. Let's have a, what David Goodhart would call an, an immigra a mass immigration pause. You know, get it down to 100,000 or 50,000, whatever you know, net. Uh, but build houses and the combination would work. It's the only combination that'll work. Do you think there's something in that? Um, I mean, it's, the picture is very complicated. You know, I'm called Liam Halligan. I come from a long line of Halligans who work on building sites, right? It's, it's immigrants that build houses. Um, I don't think the problem is that we've had too many immigrants, uh, though I do totally understand that many people feel that way. Uh, the problem is that we haven't built enough houses. You know, 2% of the England's land mass is covered in housing, right? 13% is covered by Greenbelt, right? I think the position of the Lib Dems on planning and the Greenbelt is outrageous. I don't think they can call themselves liberal. No, um, well, we know that. No one's, not... con no one's concreting over the UK countryside when the Greenbelt has more than doubled in the last 40 years, which it has, and the numbers are in home truths if anybody wants to try and disprove me. But, so, if you, look at, if you look at a country like France, France has had more net immigration than the UK, and yet they've built a lot more houses. Yeah. So their house prices in real terms have re remained relatively steady. Yes, France is a bigger country, but again, less than 2% of our land mass is covered in houses, and that includes gardens. There is tons of space, right? Yeah, tons of space if we want to use it. You know, 
get outside the M25. So few policy wonks in this postcode seem to, but there is lots of space if we want to use it, if we want to free up the gridlock of um, uh, developers holding on to land, holding on to planning permissions in order to create an artificial shortage. The house building shortage in the UK is artificial, it's deliberate, it's contrived, it's nasty, and it's extremely profitable for lots and lots of people at, at, at the top of society. It's extremely antisocial and extremely politically dangerous if we allow it to continue. I would seek to diffuse and disentangle the Ill Im issue of immigration with the issue of house building. And I'd say that's the wrong road to go down. We can easily build enough houses if we had net immigration of 200, 300, 400,000. Whether you want net immigration of two, three, 400,000 is another debate and we can solve that in the democratic way. Now we've left the European Union because it is effectively up to exactly. us, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we belittle the housing debate if we say it's a debate about immigration. I think we let the, the monopolistic oligopolistic um, uh, land banking classes off the hook mm. if we tr if we go and have a row in it's another like room about, about 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 immigration we can right. easily build enough houses for pretty much any number of immigrants we need immigration we are, we need to make our demography younger okay it's because we've had more immigration in recent years that we are going to become a bigger economy than germany over the next 25 years it's it's nailed on right demography is destiny it's in the numbers yeah but i think i think you i think there's it does interlink with i mean i think it, it, we're getting into broader pictures pictures of what of what worldview we have how indifferent we are to who 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 makes what and where and who lives where so uh, you know i think the, the sort of the, the extreme i would say extreme position liberal position would be say it doesn't doesn't matter if the total fertility rate in britain collapses it doesn't really matter we'll just we'll just bring other people in doesn't really matter. and it's the same reason that people can't be bothered to train anyone mm. uh, you know this the sort of open open borders type thinking is 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 the prevalent thinking it doesn't matter it doesn't just bring other people no, in. it's, it's very I think it's, it's very dangerous if you don't take the population with you i, I agree i know i agree but I, but i do agree i do agree with you that actually that you're what you're looking in at in home truths is fundamental cause and i think the the an establishment's been very very good at keeping that off of the off the table uh, and I think you, you mentioned green belt they, they, Just, they do it all the time yeah. they want us to have a row about the green belt they want us to have a row about immigration mm. rather than you know how it's structured how rather than yeah. doing what you know Roosevelt did I'm not talking I'm talking Teddy Roosevelt right rather than doing antitrust we need yeah. antitrust Definitely. every generation you need to kick capitalism in the shins mm to make sure it behaves. And that's not to take away the genius, the entrepreneurialism, the dynamism, all of which I absolutely yeah. applaud. It's to make sure that there's competition. Well, it's not just about the wealth of nations, it's about the theory of moral I sentiments, I, I, I as totally Adam agree. Smith taught us. I, I totally agree with you. And I think the that's why I would argue that our position is more pro-market than the Tories, far more, because we want markets to work. Yeah. And as uh, Skidelsky, who taught you, said, uh, mark, you know, capitalism will either be reformed by people that are friendly to it, or ultimately it could be destroyed by its enemies. And as, and as I said, uh, and we'll say again, being pro-market is not always about being pro-big business. Sometimes it's, it's precisely the opposite. And this is one of those instances where people who are genuinely interested in getting enough houses built in this country, who genuinely want capitalism to work, mm. have to point at big businesses who are preventing capitalism from working, mm. who are restraining capitalism mm. from working. But this isn't the only market that it's occurred in. I mean, I, I, I sort of- But it's the one that impacts most it's, it's, people most of the time. People pay yes. a mortgage or yes. rent every month of their lives. Mm. It's a huge chunk of their pay packet. Mm. Yeah, let's have a row on the six o'clock news about fat cat pay. Let's mm. have a row about a penny on income tax or not a penny on income tax. Mm. This housing issue dwarfs all those mm. issues. It's got many, many and, more and, zeros and, on. Yeah. It takes a big yeah. chunk of people's uh, income well, drains, every single it month. It drains. I mean, it, the, you, you make the point that gen generation lives. rent, generation rent in this city, generation rent, spend a bigger proportion of their disposable income on housing or just rent. So you know, get a small room in Acton or whatever. A bigger proportion than any previous generation has ever. And spent. yeah, absolutely, they spend a bigger proportion of their in 
post-tax income on housing than, and they're less likely to be able to buy a home mm. than any generation since the 1930s. Yeah, which is a disgrace. Which is an absolute disgrace. Yeah. And well, th thank you, Liam, for bringing it to public attention. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I think, I, just to finish off, I think it can only be solved when we get, when we're governed by people that actually want to, it's like so many issues, you've got to want to change it. And let's hope your book influences those to, to, so we can achieve it. Thank you for having me. Cheers, thanks.